Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. I'm excited. Um, what are we doing today? We're having another Sales Hacker webinar. And as you know, we're doing it with uh, the great Josh Braun. He's at Sales DNA. He hosts I Teach My Wife Sales, the awesome video series on LinkedIn. And he's just here to help you sell more stuff. Josh, thanks for joining us, my friend. Thanks for having me. It's amazing how when the camera comes on, your whole personality changes. Because before when you were just talking to me, you were not as excited. Right. That's yeah. how you look. Now when the crowd's here, you get all lit up. I love, I love it. Yeah, I got fake. I fake liking all of the webinar guests, everybody. This is, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I just like, I, I'm the same person. I just turn up the energy a little bit because I want to get us started on the right foot. All right. And naturally, I was just came from a speaking seminar. Quick aside, I came from a speaking seminar. Naturally, I'm a boring person. I, I come across as boring. My happiness inside doesn't come out of my face. So I just have to try to turn it up when I start webinars off. So here's what we're going to do today, everybody. Um, we got a lot of people signed up for this. So if you have questions, drop them in the Q&A. Uh, 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 yeah, let's do the chat. At the bottom of your screen, open up the chat and make sure that little blue thing at the bottom says all panelists and attendees. That way you can see the questions your, um, your friends and other attendees are asking. You can see the answers that we write. Everybody sees everything, okay? And go ahead and introduce yourselves there if you want. Over uh, almost 2,000 people actually signed up for this. So I don't know if we're going to get to all the questions, but I'm going to try to get to the best ones. So don't hold back. Ask your questions. Um, and we're going to get started. If we could, just as a reminder, you know what you signed up for, but Josh has this awesome thing called the Badass B2B Growth Guide, and it's full of, um, what is 150-something uh, plays that you can use for prospecting, closing, selling, outreach, all kinds of things that can help you sell more stuff. And today, to get us started from 2020, to kick ass. He's picked five of his favorites and really five of your favorites to walk through. So we're going to try to get through all five and then hopefully some questions in like 10 minutes at the end. And I'm just going to try to stay out of the way because this stuff is gold. So no more talking for me. Thanks for coming, everybody. Oh, one quick thing. If you walk away, if you have to leave for some reason, your house is burning down, and you just got to leave. Um, we're recording this. So you're going to get the recording and you can share it with your friends like in the next day or so. Okay, cool. Let's go. I will stay on as long as it takes to answer every single question anyone has. If sales hacker will let the film run, let me actually share my screen. So yeah, we can do going. it. You guys, you guys seeing this? We see it and it looks beautiful. Hi everyone. I'm Josh. And this is what we're going to do today. I have a guide called the Badass B2B Growth Guide. What does it do? It helps you grow your business. What does it do? It helps you book meetings and close more deals. It's got over 150 plays, but today we're going to share some of the more popular ones and the new ones that just came into the guide. What do I mean by that? Well, here's what I mean. The first one we're going to say is, how do you get crazy people to respond to your emails? That's going to be play number one. Play number two, what you're going to learn is this one. Yes, people listen to voicemails. No, it doesn't mean they'll call you back. So what the heck does it mean to leave a voicemail? The third play we're going to cover is want to overcome objections and stop overcoming them. The next play we're going to cover is one thing that can drastically improve your sales that you're probably not thinking about right now. And the final thing we're going to cover is this one. I cold called a ghosted lead in front of 43 salespeople. And this is what happened. I'm sure none of you have had a prospect disappear. Today, I'm going to give you a tactic that you can use to hopefully re-engage those prospects so you can get to the truth. So let's get going how to get crazy people to respond to your email. Does anybody out there know what the heck this is? Raise them up. A couple people know. Kevin that. Hoffer, heat map. A bunch of people say heat map, heat map, heat, heat map. Heat map, that is exactly right. It's a heat map. It shows where your eyeballs go. And this is actually from early days, early 90s. You can see at the top, there were these things called banners and they used to be animated. And when they first came out, everyone's eyes were glued to the banners. But over time, what ended up happening because the banners were no longer unique is the eyeballs would drift away from them. And as you can see from this heat map, barely any, in fact, no eyeballs are actually drawn to the banners. Um, this exact same thing is happening now with cold emails. I call it cold email blindness. And it's happening because people are using the same exact templates to create messages like you see on the right and to create follow-up messages that you see on the right-hand side. And things like this. This is one that I got literally a few weeks ago saying that my boss told me to contact you. 
or this one that's really tired, some version of the, the breakup email. I've tried to connect with you, but you know, you're not there. Let me know you're not interested. Is the timing off? You can't talk or you're being chased by a hippo. Um, when you are using all of the same emails that everybody else is using, you are yet another white vanilla scoop in a sea of white vanilla scoops. And the brain ignores things that are similar because they've seen the show before. So what I want to teach you in this play is how to write an email so that you can be the mint scoop, the green scoop in the sea of white vanilla scoop ice cream. Does it take a little bit longer to be a green scoop? It does, but your response rates are going to be higher. So let me actually walk you through how to do that by telling you a story. Anybody have any idea who this is? This is, I'm really going to date myself here. I don't know if anybody Ooh. has any clue. Does no. anybody, anybody get it? So many people. Oh, and they're excited about it too. Some, I so can't many, even, some, people, some people got maybe it. Maybe like 50 people saying Link. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody so yeah, this is, this is Link from a game called Legend of Zelda. And so let me tell you a little story for those that don't know. Once upon a time, there lived an elf named Link who lived in a city called Hyrule. Link's job was to keep Princess Zelda safe. One day, Princess Zelda was captured by an evil monster named Ganon. And there he is on the left-hand side. Ganon held Princess Zelda captive in a land called Level 9. So Link set out on a quest to rescue the princess. Using his trusty tool, the brown sword, Link was easily able to defeat level one and two monsters. He was able to make progress through those levels. But one day he had a problem. He bumped into a stronger monster in level three. And because of that, Link got a little hurt. He lost a heart. Even though Link was a little hurt, he was still able to make progress. And so what he did is he just kept using his brown sword to fight the monsters because he was still able to get from point A to point B. He just didn't know of any other way to get the job done. This is his brown sword. It's all he knows. He didn't know what was possible or what other ways were to get the job done in a better way. Luckily for him, one day, Link got a cold email from Will the Wizard. There he is on the left-hand side. In case you don't know, Will sells weapons, all sorts of weapons. Now, let me just do a quick sidebar here. Link has had this brown sword for ages. Why in the world would he ever consider switching? I mean, after all, he's getting the job done. He's beating the monsters. People decide to switch weapons for three and only three reasons. A couple of them may not be very intuitive to you. The first one is pretty intuitive, which is, dude, I'm really low on hearts. I got a flat tire. I'm getting killed in two minutes. I need a new weapon. Most of the time when you're reaching out to prospects, they're not in this category. If they were, they'd be reaching out to you. They're doing just fine fighting the monsters with their brown sword. So what do we do? Let's look at the other part of the triangle. It's this one and it's key. It's called avoiding. How can you shine a light on a problem that your prospects might have that could cause them harm? I'm a biker. If I took my bike into the bike shop to get a water bottle and the mechanic said, hey, Josh, I looked at your tires. They look like they're getting the tread low, which means you could have a flat. That's shining a light on a problem I might not have and could make me want to buy. So avoiding a problem I didn't know I was about to have. And you're going to see how this comes together in an email in a second. And the third bucket, the most exciting bucket, the one with the most positive energy is this one, increase. We're all wired to do things better. We all want to go faster. That's why Link likes to collect rubies. He's got 235 of them here. If my bike mechanic told me about new tires that were faster and more puncture resistant, I'd be in. We're all wired for self-betterment. It's why you're in this webinar today. So knowing what we know about why people switch weapons is really important when we start to craft an email because we don't want to live in that fixed bucket because Link doesn't even know he has a problem. He's making progress. Your prospects don't know they have a problem either because they're getting the job done. So we want to live in that avoid and in that increase. We want to shine a light and get prospects to think a little differently about their brown sword and why it not, might not be the safest choice as they make progress. So how do we do it? 
Let's get back to the story and look at Will's cold email and dissect it. So here's the first sentence. Hey, Link, came across your LinkedIn and saw that you're using a brown sword to defeat bad guys in levels one through three. Now, what am I doing here? I'm finding something on Link's profile that's very specific and relevant to how I can help. It's not saw you're looking at weapons. That's general. The specific is going to be more powerful because when you're specific, you show and you're demonstrating that you're actually looking at the profile and that you're more relevant. When someone emails me and says, Josh, I love your podcast, and they start pitching, not specific. Josh, love your podcast, specifically episode number 23 with Jackie Lipnicki, where you talked about how to use LinkedIn, much more specific. That's the first sentence. Now what I have to do is link the second sentence to the first sentence by asking what I call an illumination question. That's going to get the prospect to think differently about the brown sword. Here's how I do it. How are you defeating stronger bad guys in level three without losing any health hearts? Now think about that for a second. I'm getting the job done, but I am using hearts. I didn't even know it was possible to not lose hearts fighting these stronger bad guys. So this is getting the prospect to think differently about their current solution, to scratch their head a little bit, to get them to keep reading. And now I'm going to offer some third-party credibility. You know, Princess Peach just defeated level three and four bad guys without losing any health, just by using a lesser known weapon. Now, what am I not doing here? I'm not spilling the beans. I'm creating just a little curiosity because my intent here is to start a conversation on email, not book a meeting. And I'm creating an information gap, a gap in knowledge. It's why series TV shows end with a cliffhanger to keep you tuning in using that same approach in an email, lesser known weapon. What is this lesser known weapon that other people know about that I don't know about? And now I'm saying open to learning more. Not do you want to book time because this is a lower friction call to action. That's going to result in, hey, you know, tell me more. And maybe there's an email exchange back and forth for a while before jumping on a phone call. It's a much lower bar. And then at the end, what I call an adrenaline shot, just like we did in that first paragraph, we're going to make this person feel really good by saying something like this. Either way, Godspeed on your quest to rescue Zelda. Anyone who's collected 43 gems is okay in my book. See how specific that is? Will the wizard. So you can use this approach to email your prospects and all of them are using brown swords to make progress. And because Will's email had a new idea that could help Will be more awesome, kick more ass, and made him curious, he responded with this. And this is actually Link's email. I actually have a copy of it. Uh, he said, I'd like to learn more. And then Link learned about a new tool that he didn't know about called the Silver Arrow and ended up buying one. And ever since then, Link has been more awesome because he's able now to defeat level three and four monsters without losing any health, without risking his life. And more importantly, he was able to rescue the love of his life, Princess Zelda, and live happily ever after. What the heck does this have to do with sales? A lot, actually. <laughs> Your prospect is like Link. They're the hero. You are like Will the Wizard. You're just the guide. The thing that you sell is not what people buy. The thing that you sell is the silver arrow, but what people buy is the superpower that your silver arrow allows them to do better. And it's two things. It's the business result, getting rid of Ganyan, killing him, crushing him, but also more importantly, the personal benefit to that specific prospect. In this case, reuniting Link with his love, Princess Zelda. So you can actually map this out using your prospects so that you know the answers to these questions. Who specifically, not a company, not an industry, but who specifically can you give a superpower to? And what specific superpower can you give that matters to the prospect? And what clue can you find to start your email off in a way that's personalized using their LinkedIn profile? Either something that you found on their summary page, maybe they authored some content, maybe they liked something, maybe they commented on something, maybe something about their company, something that you read that ladders back to the prospect. And more importantly, what's that illumination question? 
that they may not have thought of before that's going to cause them to think a little bit differently about what they are currently using. That is play number one. Colin, you've got 30 seconds before we go to play number two. Any color you want to add here? So, you know, what's resonating with me is that this is something that we learn in, uh, in marketing too. the story arc, like your hero's story, you know, so I don't know. I like it because it's, it's taking what I think marketers do and they, you guys know they're annoying. We sit in our ivory tower and we just think about strategy all day and we pat ourselves on the back for publishing a blog blog article, but it's taking that and actually putting it into the conversations you have with prospects that make them the hero and your product, something, a tool that gives them the superpower. I like that. Love That's it. Cool. Yeah. So in your emails, are you actually talking about the silver arrow? Because most of the cold emails I get are talking about the silver arrow. Me too. Or are you talking about the superpower that the silver arrow allows your prospect to do? People don't buy braces. That's the silver arrow. What they buy is a smile so that when they go to the reunion, they could finally connect with that crush that they had in high school. Just using that as an example. Not that that was me. Okay, it was. All right. Okay, so yes, <laughs> people still listen to voicemails. No, it doesn't mean they call you back. Let's hear it in the comments real quick. This might be blatantly obvious. What's the purpose of leaving a voicemail? What are people saying, Colin? Are they typing anything and even? Are people sleeping? They're taking their it? time. Connor says it's another touch. All right. Alex says uh, to get them to reply to your email. Parker is directing the email. Charles says resonance, familiarity. I think a lot of people know. People are following my work or they are onto this. You're exactly right. I never yeah. thought of the voicemail as a mechanism to get a return call. It feels bad on my soul whenever I would leave voicemail messages and leave my phone number and no one would call me back. So I just stopped doing that. And my take is that the purpose of the voicemail is exactly what you guys are saying is a touch to actually be able to promote um, emails so that you have what's called more awareness. It's called the mere exposure effect. Google it, it's a psychological principle. And essentially it's why Coke does Coke commercials. The more you're exposed to Coke and the message in a positive way, the more affinity you have for the message and the brand, as long as it's positive and not negative. So the question is, it can't just be any voicemail, it's gotta be a voicemail focused on giving the hero superpowers. So how do we do that? Well, very similar to how we did the voicemail to the email. Let's actually figure it out and go through a real life example. So who's your hero? What superpower can you give your hero? And what can you say to make them curious? Just like a cliffhanger. We don't want to give away everything we do because then there's no reason to leave to read your email. If Game of Thrones told us everything that was going to happen in the next episode, we wouldn't tune in. Same thing. We want to create, as George Lowenstein calls it, an information gap. So let's give you an example. Um, here's a, a friend of mine, Beck Holland. So Beck Holland is my prospect or the hero. What does Beck Holland want? What would make her happier? Well, Beck Holland is hosting an event that I'm actually joining her with called Flip the Script, where she's traveling to all these cities. And what would she want? Well, look, although she is giving bread to the masses and giving away a lot of value, ultimately what she wants is these venues to be full, but not just full, full with her ideal customer profile so that hopefully she can start some conversations with these people and ultimately close some revenue. So what she wants are full events with her ICP. That's my hypothesis in studying Beck. You have to have a hypothesis like that too. And it can't just be make more money. It's gotta be very specific, like I just said. Gotta fill the seats in these events with her ICP. So knowing that, I'm gonna create a cliffhanger voicemail script that you can use too. And here it is. Hey, Beck, caught your Flip the Script post on LinkedIn, which prompted me to binge watch every Flip the Script video. Your Chuck Jones structure, brilliant. What a brilliant way to give reps freedom, uh, but with guardrails. Uh, why am I calling? Oh, yeah, I have two lesser known ideas related to filling more seats of your upcoming Boston event with VPs of sales that are generating over 10 million in ARR. Uh, no need to hit me back on the phone. Check your email. Oh, by the way, this is Josh Braun. Now, what am I not doing? I'm not saying, hi, my name is Josh with Acme up at the front. Why? Because Beck doesn't care. Beck is selfish. I know because I've met her. And all Beck cares about is what she wants, the same as your prospects. So start with what your prospects want to do better. 
and end with your name. And notice the word lesser known. Why am I using the word lesser known? Anybody out there know? Why lesser known? Give them a minute. That's a hard one. Parker B Billing says, because it's intriguing, it piques their interest. It sounds, like Schmidt, it sounds like Schmidt for Schmation Gap. Anybody get that? Come on, someone's going to get it. Yeah, we got it. Pranny. Pranny. Yeah, so I can't say your name. Pranay, there it is. Yeah, an, an information gap. Very, very powerful technique when we can use questions to get people to scratch their head and say, well, what is this? What exactly is this? Human beings are wired to close information gaps. Again, George Lowenstein out of Carnegie. Okay. Next. Can I ask you a quick question on Let's that? Let's do it. To close Let's out. So this is from Savannah Costa. So she's saying, do you think that people will just think it's another sales call if you're just throwing out information rather than telling them where you're from? So here's the thing. What, the idea of a message is to provide a new idea that can help your prospect kick more ass that they haven't heard of yet. Period. So what we're doing here is we're providing a new idea that Beck hasn't thought about yet to help her kick more ass. Where we get into trouble is where we start to talk about value propositions like I'm gonna save you time and money. That's what sounds like a sales message because that's really generic. So when you say my name is Josh with Acme and we have a, project, a product to help you save time and money and increase your conversion rates and whatever jargon you're using, that's what sets off the alarm. The other thing that sets off the alarm is when you start your voicemail message with you instead of your prospect, because your prospect only cares about them. When you start talking about them, they listen because you're talking about their favorite subject, them. And then you're laddering what you learned about them to how you can help them get a superpower in a way that they haven't considered yet that is different than what they're doing. It's a key thing, right? What is the old way? What's the brown sword way? And what's the new way? What is terrible about the brown sword? What's terrible about the brown sword is you're, you, you're, you're expending way more energy. You're running the risk of dying. You're losing hearts. And then the new way, with the new way, you don't have to get as close to the monsters. You can kill them quicker and not lose as many hearts. You can get through the levels faster. There has to be a big contrast between the brown sword and the silver arrow. Otherwise, the problem isn't worth solving. I live with problems all the time. The pixel on my TV is broken, but I barely notice it. So the problem has to be intense and frequent enough. So pick a big expensive problem and then ladder it. Thanks for the question, Savannah. Anything else on this one? Uh, any other questions? No, no, Savannah's love it. Um, she said that's something she's never tried. She's gonna test it out with her team. If it works, let me know. If it doesn't work, please keep it to yourself. That's one uh, rule. No, I'm just kidding. I want to hear it either way. All right. Uh, this is another one. Um, how do you overcome objections? Uh, so you don't. You don't. So let's, let me give you an example. Uh, this is a common one that you'll get when you make a cold call. Again, because everybody you cold call is getting the job done with their brown sword. Nobody is waiting around with a hair on fire problem. Very rarely does that happen, especially when you're doing outbound. If they had a hair on fire problem and they were down to a quarter of a heart, uh, they'd be calling you. So this is very common. And when people ask this question, it's because they don't see anything different about what you're saying. To them, it feels the same as what they have, right? So when you say things like this, we'd like to show you an opportunity why we're different you start to sound like every other salesperson that is pushing their new tool and it falls flat because people don't feel understood. Or you say something like this, does your vendor bring you 100% of the results you are expecting? Do you feel the pressure when you hear words like this? And it's that pressure that makes people repel and creates this tug of war where it puts everybody on the defensive. When a salesperson hears an objection, it's like they're protecting their little cubs. They're going on a defensive and they're playing tug of war. They're trying to overcome things. And that's a very one-sided approach. So how do you get around that? The debilitating feeling of being put on the spot and being off balance 
when someone raises an objection? Well, the answer is you don't overcome it. You merely seek to understand it. You don't have to agree with it, but you merely seek to understand it. What do I mean by that? Because some people are a little confused. If someone came up to me and was pro border wall and I wasn't, even though I didn't agree, I could understand their perspective. How long have you felt that way? What are you hoping that wall is going to help you do better? So I'm just understanding it and I'm making them feel heard. And when people feel heard, truly heard, without you having an ulterior motive, something magical happens. They're more likely to hear what you have to say. Where we get into trouble is where we try to fight back and people don't feel heard. This goes for your personal life as well or out in social situations. Someone has a contrary view to you, rather than expressing your view, put your view aside for a second and seek to understand. That's at the core of what this strategy is about. So we're gonna take you through a mindset here with we're using a vendor. So step one is whenever you hear someone pushing back in your personal life or in your professional life, be aware that they're pushing back and be aware of that internal mechanism in your head that's gonna to start to think I have to overcome this. So just take a breath. Just take a breath and center yourself and count to two. And just that fact is just gonna calm things down a little bit. And now I'm gonna give you a couple techniques so that people feel understood. We're gonna slow things down because what people are expecting you to do is to overcome stuff. And as soon as you start to act differently and have different intent, and intent is everything. This is not a trick to overcome the objection. Your intent has to be purely to understand. And when your intent is to purely understand and you have words with that intent, it's just gonna be calming like, like a yoga class rather than a CrossFit. So we're gonna breathe. And then the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna mirror. This is a technique that I learned from Chris Voss of never split the difference fame. Um, it's brilliant technique and it works super well even though it might feel a little hokey when you see it, try it in your personal life. And the technique sounds like this. Someone says, we're already using a vendor. And you say this, uh, sorry, using another vendor? Notice what I did there, slight uptone at the end. And what you will find when you take the two or three words that are the most important of the objection is, and you use that slight uptone, like you're curious genuinely, is people will just keep talking. They'll just give you more information. I do this with my wife all the time now. Every time she says something to me and I have this tendency that I want to respond and overcome it, I just mirror and she keeps talking and it makes her feel good because in this world, so few people listen. They listen to talk. And so it feels good when somebody is just listening to listen without actually thinking about what you want to say. So this is step one and it's super important. Another technique you could use is uh, that's okay. So we're already using a vendor. That's okay. Again, these are words and phraseologies that are going to just diffuse the pressure. So step three, this is what Chris Voss calls labeling. After they talk, tell me more about that. What do you mean? Um, you're going to, what I call repackage what they said. Not I understand it, but something like this. Hey, you know, Josh, it seems like you're happy with your current vendor because. And then you're just going to do the hardest thing, which is to be quiet really, really hard. This is what it sounds like. See how hard that was? People were like, when's he going to talk? Is he going to talk again? Guys, that was only two seconds. I know this is hard with all the slack, but this is what, this is what silence. Let me do it one more time because it's really, here, here we go, one more time. And then what you're going to hear back is some version of this. Yeah, that's exactly how I feel. That's right. And now that people have felt understood, you can now respond. But how do you respond? Remember that triangle? Well, we want to respond in that bottom part. We don't want to talk about problems. Nobody wants to talk about their problems to a person they don't know. But what's exciting is increase. Everybody has the desire for self-betterment to increase, to be a better version of themselves tomorrow. It's why you're listening to this podcast. So we don't want phraseology to line up with that bottom part of the triangle. Here's what it sounds like. You know, hey, I don't know if this is a fit, uh, Mrs. CFO, but would it be a terrible idea to see if there are opportunities beyond what you have now in terms of avoiding 
making overpayments on property taxes and insurance premiums. Not for now, but just so you have this um, in your back pocket. You deliver it in a nice, calm voice because we're not trying to overcome it. We're seeing, hey, not asking to switch anything, but are there opportunities beyond what you have now to fight the bad guys without getting any detrimental hearts? So let's actually break this down. This is some Chris Voss juju here as well. A terrible idea. Anyone have any idea why I'm using this word, terrible idea, instead of would it be a good idea? Guesses anybody, in the comments. Anybody know anything on that one? Why terrible uh, idea so instead of good idea? Tony Vi's guess, is it a second illumination question? And we got a couple of guesses that say negativity bias or trying to get to no. Yeah, that's exactly it because yes is a yes trap, right? People are weary when salespeople are trying to lead them down to yes. Do you want to do this? Do you want to do that? Like, I'm weary. You're leading me to yes. No is safer. So, hey, would it be a bad idea? Would it be a terrible idea to see if there are opportunities beyond what you have now in terms of, you know, avoiding making overpayments? So that's the idea of phrasing things like that because no is just safer because I don't feel like I'm being led into a yes trap. It's like when I walk into a mall and a mall kiosk person says, can I ask you a question? That's a yes trap because I know if I say yes, I'm going to be led to buying some crappy soap that I don't want. So look at this next sentence. Opportunities beyond what you have now. That's the bottom part of that triangle. Psychologically, what we're doing is we're lining ourselves up with why people buy and what interests them, which is self-betterment. So opportunities beyond what you have now. Maybe there are, maybe there aren't. This next piece is the superpower. Nothing about my product. This is showing like, hey, is there a way for you to have a superpower? And the superpower for this particular CFO, what would make them happier would be avoid making overpayments. No CFO wants to make overpayments because when they make overpayments, it makes them look bad, especially if someone finds out it could have been done for less or, or higher uh, property taxes on insurance premiums. That is the superpower for this particular prospect. You got to know this at a crispy level not save time and money. Let's see how specific this is. Property taxes, insurance premiums. Anyone know why I'm saying not for now? That's a tricky one too. De-risk it to, to relieve the pressure people are saying. What brilliant person said that? Let's point them out. Oh, a bunch of people. We've got Blake. The reason I can't say the name is so fast. Alex Moffat, Blake uh, Bethel, Adrian Wong. Alex Steven Gonzalez. The, oh, the, the, Alec, the Alex Moffat? Does it say the Alex Moffat? It does. It says, no, it doesn't say the in front of it, but. So yes, that's exactly right. So the there pressure people feel in objections is this. They're trying to get me to switch now. When you're trying to move faster than your prospects, that's when the pressure is created. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying not for now, but just so you can listen to this and see if there's opportunities for at some point in the future. And that's the, the sort of back pocket approach. And you'll find that if you deliver things like this in a calm way, and I've seen this hundreds of times in my business and with the clients that I work with, people are like, sure. Because you've taken the pressure away. You've taken the pressure away with the language. So it's intent and how you sound, not just what you say. And the phraseology and the words that you choose. Okay. We've got a couple questions. Do you want me to? So some of them are about the, uh, the, the lesser known point, yeah. which I think was in the previous section. Do you want to talk about them now or you want to save to the end? Let's save them to the end. Let's got save those it. to the end. I think we can get through these and then we can, we can have a lot of time for questions. Um, so let's go through the next one. Um, one thing that can drastically improve sales. This is another very, very popular play. This play uh, got close to about 86,000 views on LinkedIn and wildly popular in the guide. And a lot of people are having a, a tremendous amount of success with it. So I wanted to share it with you guys. So uh, Bob, his name is protected. He, he actually lives four doors down from me. His real name is actually George, but I don't think he even knows how to get into a <laughs> webinar. I hope not because he's 6'2 and he could definitely kick my ass, but he comes over all the time and he's, he, he'll knock on my door. Hey Josh, can you help me move a dresser? Can you take a look at my computer? Uh, do you have any butter? Which is weird because I'm a vegan and you would think that he would know that by now, but he still comes over asking for it. And so now, you know, 
when Bob comes over and I see him like walking to my door, um, Colin, what do you think I do? I think you uh, close the drapes and hide under your couch. I do. And the reason I do that is because Bob is making withdrawals before he's made deposits. In fact, he's overdrawn by about Big this negative much. Balance. Big, huge <laughs> negative balance. And as sales professionals, we make withdrawals before we make deposits too. What are our, what are withdrawals sound like? They sound like this. First email that says, can I have 20 minutes? Or I wanted to see if you got my email, your thoughts, and you kind of bubble an email up to the top. That's a withdrawal. Withdrawal. Does Tuesday at three o'clock work or four o'clock work? Withdrawal, withdrawal, withdrawal. And when you make too many withdrawals, just like George, people want to duck and dodge you too. They want to close the drapes, as Colin said, and hide. So there's lots of ways to make deposits. I want to show you one way that can really help you, that doesn't require you to create any content. That's quick and actually shortcuts your way to credibility and trust. So here's what it is. You're going to find some people that your prospects view as experts in the industry. So for me, that might be Beck Holland, that might be John Burroughs, that might be people like the guy uh, over at Jocko, over at Winning by Design, who have tremendous amount of experience in the space. Your prospects are in an industry that you're not an expert in, so who are you to start to lecture them? But if you reach out to experts and you just ask them a couple questions about trending topics, and you use Zoom, the technology that we're using, which is super cheap, and you just record it, and then you upload those interviews to LinkedIn, and you tag your prospect, you are making a deposit. What's better is you could actually then take those interviews and using a technology, a service called Rev, transcribe them, turn them into a little PDF or a book, and you can actually send those to your prospects as a first touch. That is what's called making a deposit. People always want to hear from experts in their field about what they could be doing better to kick more ass because remember, we're wired for self-betterment. It's why you're on this podcast. Your prospects are no exception. How do you reach out to people you don't know? Well, I actually created an email that works super well for me and my clients and it's in the Badass B2B Growth Guide, but here it is, you know, on this webinar. It sounds something like this. Um, Notice you've been leading these inside sales teams for 15 years and you love working with startups. Um, anyway, I host the show. Congratulations, everybody. You have your own show on, on Zoom. I'm looking to have conversations with specifically 12 people with 12 plus years of battle scars about what they've learned leading, uh, leading startups. Um, would you be open to being a guest? I promise to be somewhat entertaining and I promise your 23 second guest intro um, will be delightful and I'll even plug your company too. And then a humble close. Hope that wasn't too painful. Thanks for reading. Either way, thanks for leading the next generation of sales professionals. Keep up the great work. So if you sent this out to a few select experts, uh, you'll notice about a 65% take rate on this because people love it when their ego is stroked. Learn how to ask some really great questions, interview them for five or 10 minutes and post it and tag a prospect or two. And you are going to start making deposits. And when you start making deposits, four or five deposits, the withdrawal is going to be much easier. Colin, I don't know if you have anything on that before we go to the last play. You know what? It's, it, I don't think I have anything. I don't think I can add anything to that. Like you, you've already said it better than I ever could, but you've got a lot of people cheering here. I do want to say, um, Patrick, what's your last name, Patrick? Hold on. George is, on, George, George, is, George is not here. My neighbor, is he? And I've seen like- George, George didn't pipe up yet, but Patrick okay. Sullivan said, uh, you know, not, not for right now, but you could get uh, George some butter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so yeah. Something, else, something else you could do here, I'll give you guys a bonus one before we go into the right is, what are the four or five questions that your prospects are asking? Like Google, you know, top challenges of, priorities of, what are the themes? What webinars are they going to? Like Google your prospects and Google their title and Google webinars and look at the themes, like steal like an artist. And then put your spin on it and answer the question in an entertaining way. 
So just answer their questions, post your take on it. Actually, and this is like the best topic for salespeople and marketers to talk about. Because if you if you have a marketing team in your company and they've got a blog and they want to rank for some stuff, they think about SEO and all that technical stuff, then they probably know what your prospects are searching and they can tell you if you're not sure, but they should really be asking you what your prospects ask you on sales calls because it'll help them too. So if you guys talk about that t together, you can talk about how each of you are answering the questions. You can do it in your outreach. They can do it in their blog. Yeah. And if you guys have been following me for a while on LinkedIn, the stuff I write about are, are questions that I hear from sales professionals and I'm just answering them. That's all I'm doing. The I teach my wife sales stuff. When my wife and I experience a thing out in the world, we try to ladder it back to a question that sales professionals are asking and just giving your take on it. Now you have to do it in a way that's entertaining and that's new. You can't say to lose weight, you have to eat less. That's kind of duh. See what I'm doing here is I'm presenting the information in a way that's a, a new take and I'm doing it in a, hopefully an entertaining way. It's a skill you have to learn. So that's a level two thing because you actually have to have your take on it. Interviewing the experts, you just have to learn how to do interviews. So it's a little bit lower bar. Okay, last thing. Um, anybody out there in the, in the uh, I don't think anybody probably has ever had a prospect ghost them. Nobody, right? No hands going up there. Nobody. Well, we'll go through Not this me. one anyway. So I, I, uh, I do this all the time when I do workshops for salespeople. I go into an organization. I just did this a couple weeks ago, a company called Gaggle out in Illinois. And I say to salespeople, raise your hand if you've ever had a prospect that you thought was going to close, but that ghosted you. And pretty much every hand goes up. And what I say to people is open up your CRM, everybody, put the prospect on your screen. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down the rows and I'm going to call that person up and we're going to see if we can't get the conversation going again. And so I did this last week and there's actually a video of the entire call in the Badass B2B Growth Guide of the conversation that I had and the meeting that was booked as a result of it. So how do I do it? Let me walk you through it. The first thing is this. Why is this happening in the first place? Why is this happening in the first place? Can we prevent it? Let's see what people are saying to this, Colin. Does anybody have a perspective on why prospects ghost salespeople? So we could be a little more proactive. Um, so Jason's guess is because they don't want to outright reject you. Tyler says doing nothing is easier than saying no. Uh, Amy Quick, they're just tired of internal selling. Like they don't want to fight the battle on their end. A lot of people saying um, there's no value. Somebody hasn't, hasn't shown value. Okay, here's the jury split. People think that you haven't shown value or the prospect just doesn't want to say no outright. Yeah. Okay, so let me, uh, let me give you my take on it. Uh, my take on it is, is twofold. Uh, first, we haven't created an environment with the prospect where they feel comfortable telling us the truth. Mm -hmm. We've created this weird relationship where the prospect is really guarded and they feel like if they give us bad news, we're going to try to overcome and we're going to try to move them forward. So very early on in the sales process, if you have the intent to close everybody and you're assuming what you have is what someone needs, that's going to come through in how you act and how you behave. So your intent is this, Detach from the outcome, be indifferent to the outcome, have an abundance mindset. If you truly believe that and you're not hanging on to every opportunity, like a lot of reps do, that's going to come through in the words that you have in your whole energy. The next thing, and somebody said it pretty well, which is there's no difference between my brown sword and the silver arrow. It's not a big enough problem to spend money on. It's just a pixel that's out on my TV. Pixels don't inspire people to switch. The problem has to be big and frequent enough and a high priority. So let's say now we're, we are behind the eight ball and things have come off the rails. And now we do have a prospect that has ghosted us because we haven't created that environment where prospects feel comfortable telling us it's not a fit and we haven't asked the right questions. So a question that I might ask is, I don't, this doesn't, it, this doesn't sound like it's something that you wanna actually change this week, right? I mean, your brown sword is doing fine. What I'm trying to do when I ask that question is determine on the struggleometer, how big of a struggle is it? Is it, oh my God, I'm gonna lose my job struggle? Have they tried six or seven things and now they're coming to you? Or is, are they at a one or a two on the struggleometer? And the problem is, is that we try to move people forward 
that are on the low end of the struggleometer. And we get happy ears because we think because they're talking to us, they want to switch. But with just a couple of questions, we can determine if they're on the low end of the struggleometer and so we can get out. So we're not playing this dance with them. And we just have honest conversations with them. And to me, the tell is if we get to the end of the call and we say to the prospect, what next step, if any, would you like to take from here? If the prospect doesn't want to commit to a next meeting, and doesn't hold up their commitment, meaning they show up, it's not something that's top priority. And so there's a way to kind of break up with that prospect so we're in control and so that we don't spend time chasing and get ghosted. So I don't, I don't really get ghosted anymore because I have a process in place to have honest conversations and a process in place that if someone breaks their commitment, because I am detached from the outcome, I just move on. So prevention is worth an, uh, uh, just everything. But let's assume we're behind the eight ball now. We have a bunch of people out of ghosting. What do we do? So let's actually get to what to say. So I do a two-touch email and a phone call. I'm going to show you the emails. And if you want to see the actual phone call, you can go to a website I'm going to show, share with you at the end. And the, and the full call is in the Badass B2B Growth Guide. But let me give you the ideas because it's really the same thing. Email is a delivery mechanism like a phone. The idea is the same. So this is a, 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 another Chris Voss gem that works really well. And I'm going to show you an actual example. And I've got hundreds of these from clients that I work with. So prospect commits, they've ghosted you. People hate quitting. When someone says they're going to do something or they want to do something and then they go against it, it feels bad. It congrates what's called an incongruence. If you tell people you're going to show up somewhere at eight o'clock and you don't show up till nine, you feel bad. It's just a psychological way, psychological way people feel. So we can use this in our copy. So here's an example. This is a prospect that is now a customer. Um, his name is John. John might be on this webinar. He may actually know this is his, his, his email. And I'm running a thing on, uh, that I do called an eight-day challenge where we help people retool their outbound messages to get higher conversion rates. And John expressed interest in having his sales team, about 10 of them, go through this challenge and he made some commitments and then I didn't hear from him again, which happens. Uh, so I shot him this email. Hey, John, have you given up on the challenge for Q1? Within eight minutes, I got this email back. So if you have prospects that are stuck, uh, and again, this might seem like that's not gonna work. It, try this. So have you given up on whatever it is the prospect said they wanted to do? So I do that as a first touch. Then I've added some things on my own that have worked really well. And this is the second technique, uh, touch two if you don't hear back, about seven days later. And I got this, um, uh, hearing about the Sheryl Crow thing that happened on stage in Florida. So she was on uh, doing a performance um, in uh, St. Pete, and she actually forgot the lyrics to one of her main songs, which is All I Want to Do. Um, it's one of her more popular songs. And rather than her freaking out and getting all defensive, what she did is she said, um, God, I, I forgot the words. This is live. There's nothing on tape here. I'm 50. What can I say? My brain has gone to curse word. She kind of was vulnerable. She kind of took blame. She kind of fell on the sword. And when you fell on the sword and you take blame, it's like you're lying down on the ground and you're reaching your hand up saying, can you help me? I made this mistake and I slipped on this banana peel. Well, stupid me. Chris Voss has this really great phrase that he uses all the time in the situations. He's like, I'm an a-hole. It's the same idea as being, being vulnerable and falling on the sword is a very powerful technique for getting to the truth. And then when you marry that with the pressure of moving things forward, you get responses. So let me actually show you an email. This is a, a take the blame email, right? So Lisa, this is, an, this is a real email of a redacted name in the company that I got a response with. Lisa, please accept my apology. It looks like somewhere along the way I did a poor job, i have falling on the sword, of explaining how we could potentially help your SDRs kick more ass by meeting monthly booking targets. Look at that word potentially, right? Non-assumptive. My intent isn't to move anything forward, right? Taking the pressure off. Just wondering if you'd be open to sharing some feedback so I could get better in the future. Is the timing off? Is it money? Do you not trust people with receding hairlines? Now, what am I doing there? Humor is a great diffuser. 
That is called the rule of three in comedy. Wendy Lieberman is a stand-up com comic. Her joke is, I recently bought a three-piece bikini. It's a top for me, a bottom for me, and a blindfold for you. So serious, <laughs> thing, serious thing, funny thing. You can use this in emails, and humor is a phenomenal way to evoke responses because it just reduces pressure. And so that's a formula you can use. And then again, self-deprecation and humility at the end. Hope that wasn't too painful. Again, falling on the sword. Just the opposite of most salespeople, right? Pushing and being assumptive. Thanks for reading. Either way, and here's the adrenaline shot coming up. Specific. Don't fake it. When we were talking, thanks for telling me about the traits you look for when hiring SDRs. I recently told Jessica, the sales manager at ABC, about your role-playing exercise uh, to determine how coachable SDRs are, and she's already implementing it in her review process. Have an awesome week, Josh. So you can use this approach of falling on the sword. When I made the live cold call at the event, the prospect actually picked up. This is the first rep. Uh, and I fell on the sword using a specific technique on the call. And this is how the call started. Uh, hey, uh, John, uh, my name is Josh. Uh, we've never met, but I was hoping you could uh, speak to me for a second. Do you have a minute? He said, sure. I go, thanks, I'll be brief. Um, I am with a company called Gaggle. I'm a sales consultant and I'm calling to apologize. And the prospect said, apologize for what? And then I went on. And again, the full call is in the Badass B2B Growth Guide. And six minutes later, this guy went on and on and on and on and on about all of the things that were happening behind the scenes that the rep didn't know about. The rep in his mind was thinking this deal is lost forever because you tell yourself a narrative, which is often not the narrative that the prospects are telling because you're hanging on too tightly to the deal. The prospect had a lot more other things going on. He booked the meeting, accepted it on the spot. And the rep came and gave me a very uncomfortable long hug, as you can see here. <laughs> so today we talked about how to get crazy people to respond to your emails, how to craft voicemails that take the pressure off of you getting a cold call, how to overcome objections by not overcoming them. One thing you could do to build credibility faster and improve your sales. And finally, how to deal with ghosted prospects. This audience has been not only charming and dare I say good looking, Colin, but very engaging. I want to open it up now for questions. And I'm committed, if it's okay with Colin to just roll the tape, I'm committed yeah. to staying here as long as it takes because I cannot stand webinars where you're like, I just want to ask a question and then there's like three minutes. So I hate it so much that I'm, gonna, I'm committed to staying here until the questions stop. So Colin, let's go. All right, we're going to do it. I've got a bunch here. You oh, wait, wait, I have, one, I have one thing. I have a sales oh, yeah. pitch. Sorry, blatant sales pitch. If yeah. you want to get your grubby hands on the Badass B2B Growth Guide, this is the link to it. Here's the deal. It's a one-time fee. It's not recurring. You get lifetime updates as new plays come in, as I learn more, as I have more successes. These are specific things that are being used out in the field to help you start more conversations. They go into the guide for one price. Is it discounted? Never. Does it go up in price? Yes, every 20 or 30 plays. If you want to get your hands on a copy, Go to bit.ly slash kick more ass and you can see um, how it's helped other people and decide if it's right for you. All right, Colin, now we can open it up for questions. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so you can still ask questions. I'm going to start with the ones that uh, we received first. And people, if you have to run, remember we're recording this and we're going to send you the recording so you can get it tomorrow. You can fast forward and see where Josh answers your questions. We're going to stay as long as it takes to answer all the questions. Cool. Let's jump in. So, uh, Josh, we got a bunch of questions about that lesser known line you had. Um, and I think it was in your email template and maybe in, in your uh, play two or three that you showed. You know what I'm talking about, right? I do. The lesser known. Line. Yeah, yeah. So, a um, couple of questions here, all related, but I'll start with this one from Griffin. So, Griffin's question is, is the lesser known idea your product? Like, hey, we are uh, kind of a secret power we are the secret sauce that you can use or is the lesser known idea like some relevant industry info, like a stat that you find? Yeah. So we have to be very careful here. Prospects only care about two things. Help me avoid a problem that I don't know about that can hurt me or help me realize something that I can do better that I didn't know about. So you have to have some substance. This is not about your product. 
This is about a specific idea that they haven't heard about that can help them kick more ass. I don't know what that is for your product, but you have to figure out what's the contract. And the way I like to explain this is like an infomercial. We have a black and white version of a prospect in the kitchen making French fries with a knife. And the French fries are all wonky shapes. And when you cook them, they're not crispy. The kitchen's a mess. It takes forever. The family's unhappy. You're getting in a fight with everybody and it's just an awkward situation. That's the before version, but that's just the only way I know how to make French fries. So what's the lesser known idea? The lesser known idea is you can actually make French fries in a two minutes without a mess. I don't know if this is for you, but it's working for some other companies. Does this sound interesting? So the, the after version is the contrast and the contrast has to be big. If I'm only making French fries once a year, I don't care. So the lesser known idea is what is the contrast between the before and the after? So that's how I want you to think about it. What's, and that infomercial is a good example. What's that like for your product? And do you know at a very specific level? Notice when I was doing the infomercial, you saw that because you were able to visualize it. But because you don't know your prospect's job, it's probably not crispy in your mind, but you got to get there by interviewing customers, talking to customer success, salespeople, and understand that big, awful, what is about the old way that sucks? And what's the new way and, how, and why is it better? Hopefully that answers your question. But we don't want to tell what it is. We don't want to tell what it is in the, in the email. We want to say they're using a new approach that's helping them do this thing that they want to do. And then they, they want, we want them to lean forward and say, well, what, what is it that you're talking about? I love the French fry imagery. I yeah. mean, even like the crappy knife cut French fries made me hungry imagining them. But, <laughs> you know, I, I don't have a high bar. Um, so for, uh, so that bring, that's actually a really good segue because you're talking about, um, you know, in this case, it's an infomercial. It's like a product that's very specifically made for one purpose. But what if you have a product that is not lesser known? Like you're at IBM, right? And you're doing this kind of prospecting outbound. How do you, how do you frame the lesser known idea when you feel like you're already, it should be obvious, you should. You should so in order, in order for me to consider switching, there has to be something different about my brown sword than your silver arrow, right? So if there's no difference that's meaningful, so it can't just be any different, right? So by way of example, a few months ago, I was looking to move my furniture and I was driving down the highway and I saw a U-Haul truck and on the back of the U-Haul truck, there was a picture and it showed, here's, what, here's the dock loading height of every other competitor. It was really high and here's ours. It's an easy loading dock with a ramp. That's a contrast that makes my life better. It's not just a pink truck. So you have to have a contrast between the old way and the new way that they may not have heard of before. If you don't have a contrast, there's no compelling reason for me to switch. So whether you call it lesser known, new idea, different perspective, we're all saying the same thing. It's that what is it that I don't know about that can help me defeat the monsters without getting hurt so I can get home in a healthier state so my wife doesn't have to put or husband doesn't have to put bandages on me. You have to see that contrast, that infomercial clearly. If you can't picture that, your prospects aren't gonna to get to picture it. And so many emails I see are focused on templates, but not the contrast. If there's no, and, and, and it has to be, remember, it has to be intense and frequent because I'll live with my grill that only one side works because I'm just cooking salmon for my wife and I, and I don't need big si two sides of the grill. But if you shined a light and said, hey, are, did you know, illumination question, are you aware that sometimes when you light your grill with a match and only one side works that you could have a propane leak test, gas leak, which could cause a flare up and burn your face off? That's going to get me to keep reading. That's a great example of an illumination question that a rep asked that showed me something I didn't know that can cause me harm. You have to do that. You have to create that contrast. And I love, I mean, I think people are picking up on this, but you use imagery. Every time you give an example, you're not giving an example of here's how you could do it. You give a specific example. So specificity wins and you use imagery to describe the before and after and illuminate the contrast. So I love that. Right. And another example on this, because it's so key. And if you guys have followed me, you've seen me write about this, but I went to a, a triathlon. I didn't finish it. And I was at a vendor booth 
And instead of the vendor pitching his products, um, he said this, you know, are you aware of gastrointestinal distress and the effect it has on not being able to finish a triathlon? I'm like, well, what is that? I don't even know what you're talking about. That's an illumination question that's going to get me to lean forward. Another example, I walked into a store in the mall just to kill time that sold running stuff. I didn't want to buy anything. If the rep said, what brings you in today? Nothing. Do you have any problems? I don't. But the rep didn't ask that. Instead, the rep said, hey, notice you're running, wearing uh, you know, running sneakers. Do you run? I go, I do. What distance? Marathons. And then she said a brilliant question. Have you ever had a running gait check? Well, what is that? Next minute, I'm on a treadmill. And she said, are you aware that you're running in sneakers that are not made for your pronated feet? And she shows me a picture of it. And if you're running in sneakers that are not made for pronated feet, you can get injured on long runs. And as an old Jewish man, that terrifies me. And I coughed up 180 <laughs> bucks. This is the idea. I didn't have a problem. She found the problem, just like Will the Warrior did. Link did not have a problem with his sword. That's the sword he knew until Will the Warrior shined a light by asking an illumination question. There it is. Um, okay, a little bit of a shift. This one's from Pierre. And Pierre asked, uh, so he, he noticed that your emails are concise and you said a few times it's important to, to keep it short. Um, so Pierre's question is, how do you be concise when you need two sentences to describe what it is that you do, what your company and product is? Yeah, so here's my take on all this length stuff. Um, it's all relative, right? I've, I've read short emails that I can't pay attention to and that, that aren't clear. I've read other emails that are longer that are talking about a bunch of things that they noticed about me in the first paragraph that go on for six sentences. I'm like, oh my God, more. Tell me how much more you love about what I'm doing or what you've noticed about me. So it's kind of less about, obviously we don't want to have a lot of fat in the emails that we can trim, of course, but it's less about the length. And really it's more about this piece of like, who's the hero and how can you help the hero be more super, give him more superpowers? Whether that's a sentence or two sentences, doesn't, doesn't matter. But what ends up happening a lot of times is that we're not clear. We don't ask the right illumination question or we ask an illuminate question, question that's like this. Um, are you aware that in order to, to lose weight, you have to eat less? Like we ask things that are blatantly obvious, which is not going to get yeah. attention. So don't get yeah. caught up on, is it one sentence or two sentences? I've watched movies that are two hours that are awesome. I've watched movies that are 30 minutes that suck. So have you. So it's all relative to the message. Yeah. Right, right, right. Uh, okay, great, great answer. This one's from Justin. Um, you know, I'm sorry, Justin, we already answered that one. That's about the lesser known idea. So Graham asks, how do you create an information gap? Ah, so we have to get into the contrast, right? So I have a whole section on this in the guide, but the, 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 the short answer is we have to figure out what is it that the prospect doesn't know that can hurt them that they don't know about, or what is it that they don't know that can help them realize an uh, opportunity to do something better to increase? So by way of example, and I've done a bunch today, uh, let's say you're selling you know, uh, uh, a Bluetooth lock for your door. And right now your prospects are using locks that you can lock with a key. An illumination question might be something like this. Um, what do you do if you're out to dinner in the winter time and your kids lost the key and can't get in the house. Now, if I have a Bluetooth lock, what I could do is on my phone, I could pop the door open, All right? That's illuminating a problem that I didn't know I could run into with a door lock that has a key, All right? The other example that I already gave, um, how do you know the sneakers you're wearing are made for pronated feet because I know that if you're wearing sneakers that are not made for pronated feet, you're prone to injury. How do you know, or, or, or you know, um, did you know, are you aware that most people that can't finish a triathlon at an Ironman distance suffer from gastrointestinal distress caused by most nutritional products, by most electrolyte products? Oh my God, is that me? I'm using an electrolyte product. What don't I know? That's a product uh, for base salt. And the theory behind base salt is if you have this salt, it gets into your system faster and you don't have a meltdown like I did and end up in the hospital. So formulating these illumination questions is a little bit of an art where people mess up 
is they make it too blatantly obvious. And they'll say something like I said before, which is, did you know that in order to lose weight, you have to, to stop eating? Well, yeah, I, I did know that. So you have to kind of dig in a little bit deep. And what is it that your prospect doesn't know that can hurt them that your product helps them with? Or what is it that they could be doing better? Josh, are you aware that the tread on your bike tires is low? I don't want that because if I'm on a ride on a Saturday and it's 100 degrees, I get a flat and then everyone's looking at me. Weird when I'm changing my tires and I'm sweating like a mess. Hopefully that helps. I think that was great. Yeah, thanks. I th and I think that's the last question. There might be some more in the chat. I'll get to those. It's the last question I had written down about the information gap. Um, we're going to switch gears for a second to objections because Casey asked if we could do a, a pricing objection Ooh. example using the structure that you showed earlier. <laughs> so Casey, what did they, they say? The pricing's too high? Yeah. I think that's, that's what it is. Casey didn't give detail, but let's, let's say the, the prospect says, mm, you know, it's too much money. So let's actually talk about what the truth might be, right? So when someone says an objection, like the price is too high, um, it's either the real truth, meaning they literally have no money. But most of the time, it's not the truth. Most of the time, it's a smokescreen because it's a natural reaction that people have to salespeople. They just say things because it's awkward. So the first thing we have to realize is that we have to get to the truth. And the truth might be that they have no money or the truth might be there's some other thing going on. So how would I do that? So I take them through a framework. I would say uh, they don't have any uh, money. The, oh, the other thing it could be is they don't think the big pile of benefits is worth the money. So I have a, I, only one pixel out of my TV set. It's not worth me fixing it for 4K because it's only one pixel. So it could be a combination of those things that we have to flush out. So the intent, again, isn't to, over, isn't to overcome it and to convince people why our product is worth the money because ultimately they get to decide that, not you. The intent behind the approach is to get to more truth. So price is too high. I would say uh, that's okay. Uh, a lot of people think that what we have is really high at first too. Um, but price aside... Is there anything else holding you back from moving forward this quarter? And what you're going to hear when you ask that question is, well, actually, <laughs> because what you're doing is you're, you're sort of calling the bluff, right? You're sort of calling the bluff. I don't have any budget. Uh, you know, budget aside, if we were able to find money for this, um, is there anything else holding you back? Is this a top priority? You're going to start to hear things like, well, actually, this is not something we would ever do for these reasons where we get into trouble as salespeople is we actually start to think that the thing that someone is saying is the actual objection when oftentimes it's not. We've got an, an anonymous attendee saying, uh, you didn't Voss him. You didn't Chris <laughs> Voss him. Yeah. Uh, say, I'm sorry, the price is too high. That's exactly right. Great for calling me off on that. And I kind of accelerated. <laughs> I fell into my own trap. That's what I should have done. I'm sorry, the price is too high. You know, uh, what is it about the price that's giving you the perception that it's high? We have some dialogue. Price aside, um, is there anything else holding you back? Well, we could never get budget for this. Oh, that's okay. Um, would it be a terrible idea for us to work together to see if we could build a business case to this? What do you recommend? See what I'm doing? In a very Chris Voss approach, I am actually using a question to let the prospect solve it rather than me overcoming it. Another, another great example is I was in a negotiation with a necklace for my wife um, and the person said it was $5,000 and I only had 3,500 or 3,000. And I used the Chris Voss question, how's that gonna work? It's a very generous offer, but how's it gonna work if I only have 3,000? Someone said to me, reduce your services by 20%. How's that gonna work if I have to reduce my prices by 20% and still offer you the same exact uh, curriculum to get you what you want? What do you suggest? So same thing with pricing. We want to isolate to make sure it's the real objection. It's usually never price, usually. Um, usually then you'll flush out what the real truth is if you ask that isolation question. Awesome. Love it. Okay, so I think we've got one more objection question. Uh, just, uh, again, a slightly different objection. I think same, same framework still works, but we want to walk through an example for Andre. So Andre asks, um, what about the objection? Oh, we're already using an in-house team for that. Yeah, so that's the same thing as the vendor. Exact same yeah. thing. I'm sorry, in-house team. It sounds like 
And then, every, remember, everybody's using a brown sword. There's never going to be a time when you're calling someone, they're not getting the job done the best way they know how. Before we actually engage with a prospect, we got to make sure we got a big contrast. So a lot of times when I have conversations with people and I say, what's the contrast? It sounds like a pixel. And I'm like, why would someone switch? And the salesperson goes, I have no idea. I'm like, well, they don't either. So if there's a big contrast, then we can use that phraseology. Hey, you know, would it be a terrible idea to see if there are opportunities beyond what you have now in terms of whatever the superpower is? Not for now, but for later, just so you can have it in your back pocket. Because remember, people are always interested in increase. But it has to be a new idea for helping them get a superpower that they want. The Beck Holland approach. Beck wants seats filled, but not just with anyone. She wants 300 of her ICPs in those seats. If I call her and she says, I'm already, I already got that covered, which she might, I would say, uh, uh, that's okay. Um, you know, but Beck, would it be a terrible idea to explore if there's opportunities for filling even more seats with your ICP beyond what you're thinking about right now? Uh, not for now, but maybe for your later events. That's going to that's gonna perk Beck's ears up because people are always looking to level up and they don't know what you're talking about. So they're going to hear you out. And then you have to actually have some substance. The idea actually has to be different than what they have now. Not unique, uh, but different. Meaning a contrast between what they have now and what you can help them do better. Yeah. I, I always like to say you can't be better if you're not different. And... Um... So if I try to think about like things that sales hackers doing, like if we want to have an award, for instance, award season's January, right? Everybody does their awards in January. You know, there are a lot of ways you could do an award differently. But one idea we had was why not do it in June? It's at least different. And then maybe it'll be better, but we can't be better if we're not different first. Yeah. So here's the key thing with that, right? It doesn't have, different has to be meaningful or, or matter to the prospect. The example I gave with the yeah. U-Haul one, right? It's not that U-Haul said, hey, we're pink like, or I'm in June, like, I don't really care. What, what matters that's different is the loading dock is actually much lower. If you've ever seen this, you can Google it and you'll see that they have a lo an easy loading dock. Why does that matter to me? Because I won't hurt my back moving a dresser. Like that's different in a meaningful way. So it has to be meaningfully different, not just different. Yeah, cool. All right. Um, so we've got a question about the withdrawals and deposits. Yeah. All right. So um, Connor says that he sometimes sends uh, prospects invites to events. That's his, he's thinking of it in his mind as a deposit. Um, but the prospects almost never actually attend. In fact, I think so far, no people have attended. So what do you think about that as a deposit? Well, I think the deposit isn't interesting enough. So the webinars and events and emails, those are all delivery mechanisms, mm -hmm. right? This is, a, this is a webinar we're doing now. And I don't know, 1,800 or 2,000 people signed up because they care about the topic. If your prospects aren't signing up, it means that you're not interesting enough. It has nothing to do with the webinar. It means that whatever you're saying, whatever that offer is to help them kick more ass is something they've heard of before. It doesn't look interesting. So a, a, a offer isn't good enough just because it's an offer. You can't just deposit you know, anything in the bank, like carrots. Hey, I made yeah. an offer. Well, I don't like carrots. I already have carrots. Has to be like a gem that I, that I haven't seen a, a new take on something. Mm -hmm. And so I would dig deeper into what exactly is this offer and specifically, are you able to understand how it might help them do something better? By way of example, um, I got an email the other day. Uh, hey, Josh, uh, notice that you're signing up for the Ironman event um, in Montremblant in August, um, which means you're probably training for 25 hours a week. We're doing a session, 30 minutes, on how you can achieve the same results, finish, but with only training for 10 hours a, a week so you can spend more time with your family and not put a strain on your marriage, which happens to be a strain on my marriage when I train for these long events. The business impact, right? The personal impact. Are you talking just about the business benefit or are you talking about the strain on my marriage? Because the strain on my marriage is going to make my ears perk up. It's the personal thing, right? Like if you sell a service that helps kill weeds. So turning the brown grass green is certainly the business benefit. But what's the personal benefit? Well, I'm going to feel like awesome when people drive by my lawn and goes, oh my God, look at Braun's lawn. 
Like he's the envy. I'm going to line up and just look at his lawn and ask him how he gets his lawn so green. Like that's going to make me feel like awesome. So I don't know what your offer is, but generally speaking, when people aren't interested, you are not interesting. And it's Which, always you. Way. And it's always you. So blame yeah. you, not your prospect. Whenever I hear someone say, hey, I cold called and they said they're not interesting. Not interested. I said, well, you're not interesting. To that person. Like, I, I'll give you just a quick example. My grandma, God rest her soul, had the crappiest toaster you've ever seen in your life. One side worked. It made only light toast and it took forever. And me being a salesperson, I'd go in every, all the time with these new toasters and she'd never buy it. Why? The toaster was better. It had two slices, faster, darker. Those benefits mattered to me, but they did not matter to my grandma because she was not in a rush. She was only making toast for one and she only liked light toast. So your benefits don't matter unless they matter to your prospect. And I see that a lot yeah. too. Like I do all these things. I'm like, yeah, but I, I only make one slice of toast. I'm not in a rush. Yeah, but I do all these things. It's got a digital display. Yeah, but I, I only make one slice of toast. I'm not in a rush. Yeah, but you should switch because we, we got, it's faster. But I'm not in a rush. Yep. Yeah. You don't get to decide what's valuable to, their, to your prospect. They have, they have right. to decide. All right. I know my, my next guy has been uh, itching to get this question answered. It's a really cool um, question, one that I hadn't thought of. So Tony Yu, this one's from Tony Yu. Um, he, he liked the example where you're emailing somebody to ask them, uh, interview an expert example, right? And, um, but he says his clients are, are like hedge fund managers and they're super secretive and private because um, what he wants to ask them about is like, you know, how do you manage your fund? But they keep that to themselves. Um, so they don't want to be a case study. They don't want to be mentioned in any way. Any ideas, work around, or have you ever come up against like a very secretive prospect when you try to do that? Yeah, so we have to figure out, you know, so those people are speaking now, right? So they, they, they are listening to podcasts. They are going to conferences. They are doing something. Like there's, there's events for these types of people. So there are mm -hmm. people speaking at those events and podcasts and, 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 and events, right? So find those people. And what they're talking about, reach out to those people that are already talking, right? So every industry has experts. Find out who they are and get them on your show. Yeah. Rather than trying yeah, to I mean, figure out like, don't, don't approach someone that's never spoken before. Um, you know, for instance, like, you know, I keep, you know, John Burroughs and Jocko, these guys have been speaking about all kinds of stuff. Your industry has a John Burroughs. Uh, not obviously as good looking as John Burroughs, but yeah, someone like a John Burroughs <laughs> that's speaking about some topics that people would care to hear about. Yeah. Yeah, it's happening. Uh, you know, maybe they're worried about the distribution. So, you know, maybe it's not a podcast or like a recorded Zoom call. Maybe it's uh, maybe something else. Yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, sure. So, it doesn't, so the, the delivery mechanism doesn't matter. Like right. Zoom is super easy. Um, you can interview them. You can have it transcribed. You can turn it into an article. Um, you can chunk it up into each question could be its own post. I used to get more mileage out of it. I do this all the time on my a profile where I'll interview some people, then I'll, I'll chunk them up and I'll just make one post, you know, per, per day on that question. And then of course you got to, you know, uh, in that instance, you got to present your take on it, a, a little bit of a different take so that it's new. Because if you're still telling people to lose weight, you got to eat less, I don't care. Yeah, so or, or white rice isn't healthy. Right. right. Yeah, not good enough. So um, this is an interesting name. Anonymous attendee must have had interesting parents to name them that. Um, the question <laughs> is, when you're finishing up a cold approach by email or phone, how do you start the conversation? People don't want to start answering questions or having us salespeople trying to listen and not give some context about what we ultimately want or what we're trying to achieve. Yeah, so I always like to get people to opt in to my questions on a cold call. And there's a couple ways that I like to start conversations on a cold call. I'll give you my, a couple favorite openers that feel good on my soul and, you know, experiment with it. Everyone's got a different approach. But I think psychologically, people are wired to help, right? So if I'm lying down on the ground and I, got, and I got my hand up, inclination is to like reach out and, and grab someone's hand. Does everybody want to help? Are you going to run into people that are just going to be turned off by any kind of cold call, of course, because we've done this to ourselves as a sales profession. 
Um, but if you were to call someone with the right tonality, and I'll give you some of my openers, not just what you say, but how you say it. Um, uh, hey, Colin, uh, my name is Josh. Uh, we've never met, uh, but I was on your website and I, I was hoping you could help me out for a moment. Most of the time when I say that, you're going to have someone say, well, sure, what do you want? And then when they've done that, they've kind of what I call opted in uh, to the conversation. If I want to ask some questions, I might say something like this. Um, hey, you know, the reason I'm calling is that we're sharing some lesser known information about how to get higher response rates on your cold emails. And I was hoping I could ask you a couple of questions to see if this might be relevant. Would that be okay, Colin? Sounds you see fine the, to me. See, you, see the, you see the tone there? It's not so amped up. And the rest of it's objection handling. Who is this? What's this about? We can kind of talk a little bit about that. Uh, you know, but that's the idea is to get people to opt in to the questions and then to make sure that your question is a gap question. You know, what, what, what are you currently doing uh, to ensure that you're able to progress through level three without getting any hearts killed? You guys doing A, B, C? That's the idea. Oh, awesome. Beautiful. So, okay. Ready for another one? Sure. We've got a lot more, by the way, and I know we're at 3.30, almost. I'm still fine to stay on. I just want to do a time check for you. Let's go, you buddy. I mean, we okay, promise. Okay, let's, let's do it. Let's go. So this one's from Zemfira. Um, and this one, actually, we didn't even talk about this one yet. This is cool. So thank you, Zemfira. Um, how, what's a good way to structure your day for inside sales? Do you have any tips that you find yourself repeating on that? Yes, it's a great question. And, and, and kudos for you for asking it because so many people don't work in a way that's calm. Mm. What I mean by that is they have 60 windows open. They've got Slack open. They're bouncing around from thing to thing. The way to be most efficient and to make the most amount of money is to do one thing at a time. That's the same thing. So for instance, from four to five o'clock, you block off your calendar to be able to prepare a list of 40 people that you are going to call the next day. When I work with reps and say, show me your list of 40 people you're going to call for the next day. What I often see is people hunting around in a CRM and calling one person at a time. So block off your time for preparing the list and doing your research, filling in your fields with your research. That's an hour, hour and a half a day. So that when you leave, you actually have a list of 40 people to call and then block off some time. Meaning the only thing that you're going to be doing is you're going to shut down Slack. Everything's going to be okay. Nothing is going to change if you don't respond to Slack for 20 minutes, despite what everyone says, the world's not going to end. And you're just going to make 45 minutes to an hour to, to make your calls in the morning and the afternoon. And then another block for email and just work in a very calm way. And when you're working in those blocks, make it very clear to people that you're not going to get interrupted. You're going to turn off Slack. You're not going to have any windows open and that's it. So it's a very simple concept, um, but so few people do it. Yeah, it's a thing where you, you say it, everyone nods their heads and agrees. And then it's actually, you know, unfortunately kind of hard to put into practice. I think because of the peer pressure, like everybody's running around you, you feel like you have to run too. But yeah, that's an interesting story, thing you bring up. It's like the, the knowing is not the hard part. Right. The doing is the thing that's going to help you get more results. So everyone knows this, but are you doing it? That's the key. <laughs> Yeah. And like find a friend to hold you accountable, you know, yeah. and, and, and it's not your manager, by the way, <laughs> right. uh, your manager probably wants you to, uh, to, to be doing lots of things because they're probably in the same situation you are. They're probably doing too much, too many things at once, totally. um, but find a friend and, you know, do your time blocks together and then check in at the end of the week and ask each other how you did and then do better next week. Love it. Um, that's, I say that cause I've, I've done that and it helped a lot. Uh, uh I'm going to take some time to process that question. Here's a simpler one that I can process quickly. The question is, uh, should you always connect with your prospects on LinkedIn? Like, do you have rules about channels that you use? Great question. So it depends on where your prospects are. So again, these are just delivery mechanisms for a message. If your prospects are on LinkedIn, it's a great channel. If they're not, it's not. If the phone, if you, like I work with a company that were app developers that you just couldn't get them on the phone. Phone's not a good channel. So how do I know that? Because they made a thousand calls and their connect rate was under 2%. Well, 
when it should be over 5%, which is the industry average. Um, so if you're connecting at 5% um, and you have a conversation with someone, 20% of the time that's converted to a first meeting, right? But if you're not getting the people on the phone, not a good channel. So it depends on the channel. I'm a big proponent of using multi-channel and I'm a huge proponent that you should only be working about 35, max 40 accounts at a time and a huge proponent of sending a letter as a first touch. We didn't get into that on this, but there's a bunch of stuff in the Badass B2B Growth Guide about how to make a really good first impression um, using direct mail so that you are the mint scoop. I'm in the sea of vanilla scoops. And writing a, a direct mail is a great way to do that because it is different. Obviously the message matters, but there's a way to uh, craft messages in, in direct mail and do it in a very delightful ways that again, make your subsequent touches uh, more receptive to your prospects. Where we get yeah, into trouble I, is where we're working a thousand counts and we're blasting out a ton of emails. Tools make it really easy to do that, but you're obliterating your market. You're making a bad first impression. And when you make a bad first impression, people want less of you. I'm always really surprised how few phone calls I get compared to how many emails I get. It's easier. Yeah. It is. It's easier because it can be automated, but I would probably be more likely to respond to a phone call because every other call I get is a robot. So if a human calls me, yeah. I'll have a and, and again, it depends on how you're making the call too. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Have to do it right. So, um, okay. Good, good question. And thanks Zemfira. This is a cool one from Amy quick. They're all cool ones. I say that. Wait, Amy time. quick. Why does that sound? Amy quick sounds familiar. She's, I think I've seen her on LinkedIn, right, Amy? Amy, she's right like, in if we've seen you on LinkedIn. I think she's been like in my feed. I, I don't know. She sounds, that name, for, for instance, stands out for me. Okay, what's her question? She, it could be like an author name, it sounds like, or like okay. an actor, <laughs> stage name. Okay, so the question is, so Amy had, I'm going to paraphrase Amy if that's okay. Uh, so she had a former, a champion, who she calls former champion, because this person said that their manager was holding up the deal. And Amy wants to know, what do you think about going around that champion to this manager who is holding up the deal? Um, like what's your take on the relationship between Amy and her champion and would it take pressure off the champion if they're having trouble getting the desired internal action on their side? Yeah. So this is, I'm going to, I'm going to take a playbook out of uh, uh, from Beck for a second. And I, I agree with her on this approach, which is we have to make sure that we're getting to the truth. We have to get out of this, this kind of buyer seller dance. So what I would have, as a conversation earlier on with this person and say something to the effect of, um, you know, can I level with you for a second? Mm. And they'll say, sure. And then you can say, you know, a lot of times when people tell me their manager's holding up the deal, it's really a polite way of saying that they really don't want to move forward. And the last thing they want to do is talk to yet another annoying salesperson. Does that kind of describe how you're feeling or am I just rambling here? Whether you use those words or not, the intent here is again to just get to more truth. Because oftentimes what people are telling you, and we've done this to ourselves early in the sales cycle and as a profession is people just don't feel comfortable being honest with salespeople for, for right reasons because they feel like the, the pressure is going to move forward. So using some phraseology, you know, my intent is to not move things forward. I certainly don't want to be that person, uh, that knowing person that follows up. The other key takeaway here is, and this I see all the time, is don't let your prospects drive the sale. Yeah. If they're not holding up their end of the bargain, and they don't have the commitment, then you can send some of those breakup emails that are in the guide and calls and just move on. Where we get into trouble is where we're hanging on too tightly. I think there's a song, hang on tightly, hang on loosely, you're gonna lose control. Like, don't wanna hang on too tightly. And so if you have a process in place where if that person isn't hanging on, I was in a, doing a pipeline review yesterday, this was in a stage for 279 days because the, the, the salesperson's not in control. So with me at the end of the call, the tell is, is are they committing to a next step? And is that step calendared? And is it coming from the prospect, not me? And are they, hold, are they holding up their end of the bargain? And if not, we just break up and we leave and we move on with our day. Yeah. Where, we get into this, where we get into trouble is where we're chasing and we're desperate. And the smell of desperation is, is off-putting to everybody, even in your personal life. Hopefully that helped Amy quick. Sounds like a superhero, like Amy Quinn, right? I know. It's a, it's a cool name. Um, oh, I, okay. So Jonathan Garcia, um, you brought up comedy at one point. Yeah. Self-effacing humor. 
Jonathan Garcia asks, do you tweak your comedy level in messaging depending on your prospect? I.e., do you try to do you try to avoid comedy when you're talking to those in financial services and accounting and then ramp it up when you're talking to people in SaaS? I love this question so much. Do people in financial services don't watch Netflix, right? Yeah. They don't, they don't, they don't like to watch stand-up comedy. They're not people. Like everybody is not someone else when they come to work. They're going home. They're watching Curb Your Enthusiasm. They're watching Netflix. They're watching stand-up. If you are vanilla, you are vanilla. So obviously there's certain different types of humor. And is it always going to play? No. But is it worth the risk? Absolutely. So one way to use humor is to find out what the inside language is of the prospect. So Google like prospects and memes, right? So one guy did one to me that I thought was pretty brilliant, which was, um, I would do a triathlon if only I could run, swim, or bike. Like, that's <laughs> kind of funny, right? It's self, self-deprecating humor is usually safe. The, the rule of three is safe. But if you go on my website, joshbron.com, you will see responses from C-level executives, financial, whatever. Like, they're people. You're not selling to financial services. You're selling to a person. Um, will that person not appreciate your humor? Maybe. Just like comedy, they go to a stand-up and not every joke hits. But what's the alternative? Being vanilla? I'll take my chances yeah. in being a mint scoop. <laughs> I love it. Uh, it this is a, a quick question, but we got it once or twice. Uh, you said you do not offer discounts on the badass B2B growth guide, right? That's correct. And the reason I don't do that is for a couple of reasons. One, it doesn't feel good for people that paid full price. Um, two, the price goes up as I add more plays or more value. So you can lock in at a certain price, but if you buy, you'll, you'll never ever have peace of mind knowing that no one got it cheaper than you. It just feels kind bad of for everyone that paid. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it's kind of a built in uh, discount in a way on the future value. Cause you buy now it's going to be, it's going to cost more for others in the future and there will be more value in the future because you add to it. I just made a huge mistake. What mistake did I just make? So that's an objection, right? So oh. let me, let's play it out. So if that, oh. that person's in real time, Josh, you never offer a discount. I'm going to say um, a discount. So let's have that person respond. Yeah, let's do it. So what, 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 are they, um, what, what is, uh, what is prompting them to ask that question? I don't know if they're going to play uh, along or not. Yeah, I, I, I'll play. They, they had some more info in there. I can play along for them. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm going to start from the beginning. Okay. Josh, do you ever offer a discount on your, on your um, badass B2B growth guide? I'm sorry, a discount? Yeah, I mean, I, just the, the holiday bills got to get paid before I can get uh, value from your training. So it sounds like you went on a mad shopping spree during the holidays and that money is super tight to invest in training at this time. Uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much where I'm at. So how's it going to work if I offer you a discount and I've never offered anyone else a discount? Uh, well, uh, I, you know, I figured it wouldn't hurt to ask. And, um, you know, we're having a conversation here. We're one-to-one. -one. This isn't necessarily visible to everybody else out there. It's just you and me and the other couple hundred thousand people in this webinar. That is something I simply cannot do. Okay. I guess I have to wait to buy, to buy the guide, you know. Sounds good. That's probably, and I mean, just I'm, as an I'm FYI, guessing. Not, not, to, not to put any pressure on you, um, but uh and, I, and again, I completely understand the situation, but the, the, uh, the guide does, uh, you know, continue to go up in price. It started out actually, it was uh, $49. Uh, so just as an FYI, not to put any pressure on you at all. Okay, good to know. So that's, that means- that's, But you see, they approached the mistake that I made at first was I responded mm -hmm. and then I caught myself and I mirrored. And then I used a question, you know, it sounds like, and then I used what's called a calibrated question. How's that gonna work? if I offer you a discount and I've never offered anybody else a discount before. And then I got assertive at the end. Now, that is something I simply cannot do because again, I have an abundance mindset on the guide because you know, over 660 people have bought it. And so I'm okay if this person um, isn't prepared to buy it and invest in it right now. I don't know their situation. And, uh, but I'm not, what I'm not prepared to do is ever discount it. 
And around the holidays, I was getting all these emails about, are you going to discount it for Black Monday? And I said, what I, what I will do is I'll donate a percentage of the prof proceeds. I think it was 30% to a, a cause. And I named the cause uh, Kiva. Um, but the, 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 the price is never going to be discounted because of the reason I mentioned, it's just not fair for people that actually paid full price. And it also ruins your, it also lowers your uh, perceived value. When you discount stuff, it lowers the perceived value of the product and it treats people that your products um, can be discounted. Mm. Instead, what I like to do is add more value to it. So what we're yeah. doing is we're adding more objections. We're adding more direct mail. We're adding this, we're adding that. Every month there's more stuff added. It's not a recurring fee. It's, it's a one-time fee of I think 197 now. And do you focus on prospecting it or is there stuff further along pipeline about like, you know, closing and demos and stuff? It's pretty heavy on the booking meetings. There is stuff in there about objections. There is stuff in there about nurturing and there is stuff in there about how to have initial sales conversations, but it's primarily cool. focused on top of the funnel. And if you go Excellent. to the website, okay. you can actually see um, what has changed for the better for people that bought it. And also you can see the table of contents so you can decide if it's something you want to invest in. The other thing that I offer on it, just as an FYI, not to turn this into a pitch, is a, is a guarantee that you decide in terms of the time frame, uh, meaning that you can use it for two years and then you can say to me, I, I hate this thing and I'll refund your money. So you get to decide the term of your guarantee. Um, if you're not getting any value from it, it's not helping you, I'm more than happy to, to refund your money. That is brilliant. That's amazing. I love that. Yeah. Uh, all right. So here's, here's another one. Also anonymous. How do you feel about bullet points in an email around what makes your product unique? So nobody cares about you, your bullet points, or your product. Bullet points kill. It's not about the bullet points. It's about the message. And we established earlier in the webinar, but what people care about is the superpowers you can help them with. What can you help them yeah. avoid that they don't know about that can cause them harm? Why is their current solution no longer safe, the best choice? And what could they be doing that can help them kick even more ass than they're kicking now? That has nothing to do with your product and your bullet points. And again, we, we kind of structured an email along those lines earlier in the, in the day. So this is one where um, for a long time, I thought these kinds of things mattered too. And it's because I w didn't have the experience of receiving a lot of these emails, having a budget being sold to. Um, and so now knowing what I know now, what I recommend to people who also who have never held a, a budget but need to sell something is uh, find somebody in your organization who does hold a budget and ask them for a favor. Ask them to set aside some prospecting emails or um, uh, invite you to attend a sales demo that they're taking from somebody who's trying to sell something to them just so you can sit in the buyer's shoes for like 30 minutes or an hour and watch their reaction to opening those prospecting emails they received or watch their reaction to what they hear on the sales demo. Um, even if it's a different product than what you sell, you'll get an idea just a little bit of what it's like to be a buyer you do stuff like that too, right? Like you, I mean, you talked about the, the expert interview, but you shadow and, and do things like that with your prospects, right, Josh? Yeah, I talk, I, you can never know your prospect's job well enough. And there's usually yeah. a disconnect because you've never done your prospect's job and, and therefore you sound so generic and vanilla. Yeah. Right, so I'll give you an example. So I'm gonna give you two emails or two met sales messages. It doesn't have to be an email. One from company A and one from company B. And assuming that you're in the market for a bike saddle, which one resonates more with you? Here's company A's message. We sell the most comfortable bike saddles. They're made of the finest quality leather. They are used by the best triathletes in the world, including Joe, Melinda, and Chris. Now for message B, and assume you have to choose one. Josh, I know that you're training for an Ironman in Montremblant, Canada, which means that you're taking six hour rides on Saturday, right at around hour three, you probably start to have some numbness and chafing. You probably have to get out of the aero bars and your lower back starts to hurt. Notice the difference there, B, right? Mm -hmm. Because B is about what I'm struggling with. And when people can relate to the problem at a crispy specific level, 
the next logical question they have is, well, what do you have? I mean, it's just normal to be uncomfortable in the saddle when you're riding it for six hours. Well, what I don't know is that this company sells something called the buy saddle. Turns out that it actually adjusts to your sit bones. How do you know your saddle fits your sit bones the proper way? That's the illumination question. Well, what do you mean? Aren't all saddles the same? Well, no. This saddle adjusts so that you can be more comfortable with regards to your sit bones. That's the contrast, right? So notice the difference in the messages. One of them is very crispy. It's clear that this person knows my world. And the other one is generic. Absolutely. They don't know. You know what other does yeah. a great job of this? People that sell these services where they, they, they take care of your dog. I had a dog once and they charge an absurd amount of money to board your dog and they give you like video of your dog at night and write-ups of how your dog behaved during the day. Why is this? Because dog owners are nuts. They want to write up on how their dog behaved and how they interacted and like, and they'll pay for it. That's someone that knows the dog audience. Like rather than saying we board your dog, like we, we're going to give you write-ups of your dog. So you know everything they did, how many dogs they interacted with, how, how long they played. People eat that stuff up. It's like a, a little report card from their dog. That's someone that knows the audience. Right, so this is, that's why, you can, how do you get to know them? The best way is to interview prospects that recently bought using an approach called jobs to be done. We won't get into that. Second best way is to listen to inbound discovery calls, not the pitch, but the beginning. You know, what, what prompted you to want to chat with us today? What'd you try that didn't work? How'd you end up here? Hear the struggle. Create a lingo library of those things. Third way is uh, look at your cu customer's uh, case studies, not for the marketing lingo, but for quotes in the before section from customers. Fourth way, not as good, because it's coming not from the horse's mouth, talk to customer success. But sp and listen to podcasts that they're listening to. Attend webinars that they're listening to. You can never get to know your prospects well enough, ever. Yeah. And you can use that for your marketing message. On my website, there's a line that says, um, send, you know, moving from inbound to outbound and getting your teeth knocked out. That's, from, that's directly from a prospect that I spoke to. So what's prompting you to talk to me today? I just put that on my website. I love it. Yeah, let other people do your marketing uh, and yeah. your messaging get Colin, for yeah, you. Get Colin out of his job. That's what we all want to do. Put Colin. Yeah, uh, please help me retire. Um, we've got a combo question here because we got two sides of the coin from two people. So Shay Shani and Connor Mahoney um, have basically asked, paraphrasing here, how much is too little or too much lead research like should you not reach out if you can't find the hook or the personalized item and how do you know when you're going too far and you're hitting that law of uh, diminishing returns on doing lead research that, that is a, that's such a great question i i think we, have, we didn't get into this in this session but there's about six or seven ways you can find things that are relevant in order of effectiveness you know a, a least effective one is hey josh notice you went to florida state you know, it's kind of a weak one, but you can, you can kind of use it in a creative way. You know, just like those hatchets at Florida State, what happens if we hatchet the amount of time it takes you to do X, Y, and Z? You can kind of get creative with stuff, but you can usually find a hook. Um, if you can't find a hook, look harder. Um, again, there's lots of things in the, in the guide or hit me up on LinkedIn and I'll walk you through. Or actually check out um, uh, Beck Holland does a great thing on this where she goes through all these what she calls premise buckets, ways to personalize the first sentence of an email. Um, in terms of too much, when you get good at this, um, you should be able to find those things in no more than two or three minutes per prospect. So certainly not more than five minutes. Interesting. And it, and it's, yeah, you want to, you want to do a little bit more than with the school they attended. Um, yeah. the, 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 key, the, key piece to, the key piece to it is it has to be specific. Like it can't just be love your podcast. It's yep. love your podcast, especially the episode with X about Y. And then the other key piece that people really miss is the linkage. You have to link what you found in that personalized sentence to the next sentence. And the best way to do that is to just carry, a, you know how you used to carry the one when you multiplied? Like carry a couple words yeah. from that personalization thing down, just like you saw in the sample email uh, with the illumination question, like carry a word down from the, from the top down to the second or third sentence. Right. That's some good advice. Uh, uh, let's see. Let's find another one for you. So, yeah, in terms of personalization or customization, let's say you've got a, a long sequence. You gave an example of a sequence with three touches. Let's say you have a longer one, like, say, eight. Um, should you really just personalize the first touch? 
spend your time there and then let the let the rest run or do you try to get it you know all the way through the whole sequence so my take on it is is if you can find two nuggets in a sequence you know two opportunities to personalize that first line um, that to me is the best bet uh obviously not every single email but the certainly uh two out of a sequence of six or seven is is very reasonable uh, to be able to do and again mm. um this 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 again i, I kind of don't like getting into tactics like this too much because this can yeah. be done well and poorly. It's not so much that you're personalizing it. The bigger issue is most of the time when this doesn't work, it's because of what we talked about earlier. That the, It's not interesting enough. The, the brown sword, you haven't made a compelling case for shining a light on why I should switch from a brown sword to a silver sword. Because if you haven't, I'd rather dance with the devil I know. It's risky to switch, <laughs> right? Yep. I'm going to get fired if it doesn't work. It's a pain in the ass. I got to get legal involved. It's like, it's a lot of what we call in the Jewish religion, a lot of Mishigas, you know, so it's got to be really compelling and big. And that's where most of the people miss. It's not less about personalization. It's really nailing the, the before and after and really understanding that it's, it's big. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard that phrase as like relevance over personalization, but same idea. Um, yeah. Cool. Uh, so let's see how many more we got. We're actually coming up on the end of the questions here, I think. Okay. And uh, there's over a hundred people still here with us. So thanks for hanging out for almost two hours. I think we'll be able to wrap up in the next 10, 15 minutes max. Cause I've got to run to do something at 4 PM Eastern. Okay. Um, but this has been really fun. I think we can fulfill our promise of answering all the questions. All right. Like, let's do it. So we've got a specific scenario here. Uh, so someone's uh, been, been prospecting into an account and they, they got out, um, Okay, they, they, it sounds like they made some headway. They got an internal referral and they got, and they're trying to figure out now they're at the stage of finding budget. And they've sent a couple follow-up emails and they have been ghosted. Trying to yeah. just get a call in the books to talk about budget. Is being yeah. ghosted at this stage different than being ghosted earlier on? Any tips so this, for is a, this, is, this is a symptom of what you've done incorrectly earlier on in the sales process. Mm. Because this is the thing we have to understand with budget. It might not be, it's usually, sometimes it is, it's usually not the real objection. So earlier on in the conversation, we have to be able to have conversations with people. And if they were on the phone, you know, you know this is, uh, you know, we don't have the budget for this. Um, you know, budget aside, is this, I, I wouldn't assume this is something you'd even want to do, right? You got way more priorities in order. Actually, yeah, we got like 50,000 things that would take way more precedent over this. We would never do this this quarter. Thank you. Now I can move on with my life. Because right, oftentimes what we do as salespeople is we think that the budget is actually the real objection. Oftentimes it's not. And where we get into trouble is where we treat the objection like it's the truth. We also get into trouble when we treat truths like objections. Right? So someone says to you, I can't talk right now. I'm going to the hospital. My kid just got in a car crash. And you say, but can I steal 37 seconds? That's going to piss people off because when someone gives you the truth and the truth is it's specific, it's got oomph to it. We, we don't have budget for this because we had $300,000 and we're spending 297,000 of it on these other three initiatives. And therefore we don't have money for it this quarter for this thing at all. That's specific. And that's the truth. But oftentimes when someone says it's budget, that's like saying that's, it's too generic. It's not probably the truth. So we have to be able to have, the right conversations with people and the right conversation with this particular thing is, um, you know, budget aside, um, I don't assume this is something you'd even want to do, right? You got like a bunch of competing priorities. Yeah, we actually do. We have to flush that out. Where are they on the struggleometer? Is right. this a top priority for your, for just you or your CMO or whoever you're reporting to? I'm assuming that they're not going to want, you guys are solving this problem fine in house, right? Yeah. Yeah. I just had to have that conversation with somebody who's trying to sell me a referral marketing tool. It's something that I really, really want to use. I think it would be really cool to reward people for referring their friends and colleagues to sales hacker. Uh, but it's, you know, it's not a problem that I don't have it right now. It would be a nice to have, I got enough to do. And I just had to sit him down and basically say that to him. And that's, he was a, that's a key thing. That I, yeah, that's, that's right. But you have as a salesperson, you have to get to that because remember right. in order to move someone forward, there, you know, there's the, those four things, uh, you know, money, line of sight to authority, immediacy, and character. Character is a big one. Are they holding up their end of the bargain? Mm. 
All those things have to be questions that you ask very early. I present money very fast in conversations. Someone asks me what something costs. I don't wait and say, let me show you value first. I give them a number. I say, I'm, I'm $12,000. I come in for the day. How's that sound? We got, got it out yeah. in the open. You know, just we talk about it. Because you're in business to make money this quarter, whatever your sales cycle is. And if you have someone that's not ready, you can't waste the time chasing. And I, I work with a salesperson yesterday, 150 things in their pipeline. They're not real. None of them are real. The tell to me is, is there a next meeting scheduled on the calendar that the prospect committed to and that showed up for? If not, it's playtime. That's the, that's the really the tell. Is there momentum? Yeah. Uh, let's talk about gatekeepers real quick. Love it. So Prene is trying to sell benefits to small businesses, like 30 to 50 employees. And it sounds like she's meeting some kind of like generic gatekeeper, like an office manager before the HR person. Um, Patrick O'Sullivan right here in the comments, people are helping each other, which is awesome. Patrick O'Sullivan suggests, Prene, uh, you could just ask them for help. Failing that, ring before or after work when the gatekeeper isn't there. See if you can get straight to like an HR person voicemail. What do you do there, Josh? Yeah. So here's my take. Let's stop calling people gatekeepers because it brings up negative connotations. Let's just refer to them by their name. So it's Sue, it's John, it's Paul. And gatekeepers aren't people to get around. Nobody wants to feel like they're not valued. Nobody wants to feel like you're trying to get around them to get to someone more importantly. So my take is I treat a gatekeeper. I treat Bob or Sue the same way that I would treat anybody. So Colin, pick up the phone and you're going to be a quote unquote gatekeeper. So say hello. Uh, Hello. Hi, Colin. My name is Josh and I was hoping that you could help me out for a moment. Okay. What can I help you with, Josh? Thank you so much. I promise I'll be, it sounds like you're in the middle of lunch. Are you eating avocado toast? You're out in California. That's what you guys eat out there, don't you? Is that what you're, are you like in the middle of something? (laughs) <laughs> Sorry if you can hear me chewing. It's actually an Italian sub. Oh, salami or are you like a vegan? Oh, uh, salami. Yeah, I, I oh. love my salami. Okay. Oh, sorry. Let me, uh, so, okay. Thank you. So, so the reason that I'm calling is that we're actually sharing some information with VPs of sales about some new ideas for helping them close revenue at a faster clip and not get any stalled deals. Um, for that reason, I thought John Smith would be interested in this information. But Colin, since I have you on the phone, um, who do you think I should best connect with? Um, you can talk to me about that. Uh, so, so, so fantastic, right? So now, now what I'm doing is I'm not trying to overcome it, right? So I'm try- what I'm trying to do is I'm enlisting the help of the gatekeeper to help me determine if this is something that would be interesting to the organization. Hey, Colin, does this sound like something you guys would be even interested in? Or I, I would imagine you guys are closing enough sales right now. Oh, I could always use more sales, right? You know that. Yeah. And so then I, we're, I'm in a conversation. So what this is, it's, it's an event. It's a one-on-one event. And we're going to be yep. sharing some X, Y ideas. I'd ask him some, some discovery questions. Do you think that's something that John would be interested in, in attending? You know, over the next couple of weeks, we have a couple of slots open. All right. And let's, let's say for the purpose of example that, mm, no, I, I, John's always pretty busy. I, I just don't think he has time for, for things like this, Josh. Who could be more important than I am? <laughs> no, I, I, I totally get it. You know, hey, you know, would it make sense to see, or would it be a crazy idea if you think this is interesting to see if John would be open to meeting at a time that works better for him, maybe in like three weeks? I, again, I don't even uh, know if this is something, but if I'm hearing you right, it sounds like something he might be interested in attending. Is it, is it like a time thing? Yeah, he's just, he's always uh, very, very busy and, and usually doesn't take, take meetings. He leaves that to me. What do you recommend doing? Um, well, you can send it over to me if you want, uh, the information that you referenced. What I'm going to do is I'm going to send you in the mail a little salami that you've never had before from this deli up the street that you don't even think you do, as well as a little summary of this. And would it be okay if I gave you a ring in a week after you've had an opportunity to, to digest it? That sounds great. Hopefully it doesn't take me a week to digest your salami. (laughs) So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually send a a handwritten note. Thank you note, right? I'm going to go the extra mile. I'm going to make good on my commitment. And then I'm going to follow up. And you'll notice if you send a nice thank you note or salami or whatever the thing is, 
um, with what you have, which can benefit the prospect, help them kick more ass, um, the gatekeeper is going to be on your side. Where we get into trouble is where we're on the opposite side of the table. So what I'm doing here, when I ask the question, what do you recommend, is what I'm doing is I'm getting on the same side of the table as the gatekeeper rather than trying to be on the opposite side of the table, rather than saying, what about in three weeks? You know, what, what do you recommend? And they said, well, and they gave me some information. I'm, I'm not, you know, the time is really a, a problem right now. Well, what do you recommend? Oftentimes what I hear is, well, how about we get something on the calendar for three weeks? Fantastic. But shifting that, it's a very much a Chris Voss approach into shifting it into, you know, help me solve this problem rather than me solving it. What are your ideas? You know what? I, 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 in that role play, I made it difficult on purpose, obviously, but um, I was tempted to just say, uh, yeah, you know what? Three weeks might work for John Smith just because of the way that you were approaching me and show you, you weren't just trying to bust the door down and get through me. Um, even just that little bit of empathy. And then I decided to throw up another wall, but yeah, I think (laughs) that works. And it's also okay that if the walls are rolled up because luckily you have 70 other people to call. Yeah. This kind of gets back to intent when I'm trying to hang on too tightly, then I'm being, uh, my, my words are going to dictate that notice. I, you know, I let, I let go. I, I said, you know, how do you, how do you, what do you recommend? You think this is interesting. I assume it's not. If it is, is it time? If it's time, what do you recommend? Send me some stuff. Okay. No problem. I don't have to close everything on the first call. I could send up delightful notes, a great opportunity for me to be delightful and to make a great impression with a, with a note in the mail. All right. Here's what I want to do, Josh. We have four minutes and now until my next thing that I just got, I can't miss. Unfortunately, I feel sorry, everybody. Um, well, can we do some rapid fire? We've got one, two, three, four, five, six more questions to jump through. What's more important, Parker Billings? My boss. <laughs> gotta go talk to Max. Yeah, sorry, guys. Max is the man. I gotta go talk to him. Um, so we're gonna do some rapid fire. We're gonna. I'm gonna. We're gonna make this promise happen. We're gonna answer all the questions. So here we go. Answer them really fast. Okay. Pierre. No. Asks, no. Yes. Yes. No. No. Go ahead. We're done. No. Uh, Pierre asks, how should you end a cold sales email? Open ended or adding value? Or is there a specific way you always end? So let's stop saying adding value because no one knows what the hell that means. And I like low friction Thank calls you. to action. Um, open to learning more. Does this sound interesting? Want to learn more? Uh, you know, would a, would, a, would a brief email exchange make sense to see if a broader conversation is in order? What I don't Beautiful. like is you want to meet for 45 minutes. Yeah. Low friction, cause action. Perfect. Uh, Jessica Orozco, cool name, asks, any suggestions on what subject lines work best? I think we get this question in every single webinar. Yeah. Tons of stuff in the guide, but vague things that don't make a lot of sense to create an information gap. Right. Right. So, so for, for instance, curiosity. yeah. Um, idea for FTS in Austin idea for flip the script in Austin. Cool. Okay. Um, make, make the, yeah. Don't give away the whole, you know, what else uh, is a good subject line is the person's first and last name. Just straight up their name. Josh Brown, Colin, Colin Campbell. That's going to get an open, but the idea isn't an open because it has to actually then ladder to what you say. So it's, there's some lot of tricks. There's a, there's one that I saw, a couple months ago that was making the rounds that was pretty clever, but you have to tie it in was the audacity of this email. <laughs> you kind of open it up. You have to you gotta, follow up on that. Yeah. You got to you gotta, you gotta kind of tie it in. I like that. Yeah. All right. Aaron Schwartz asks, is there any particular advice you can give for prospecting government agencies that may be different from a B2B strategy? So this is great. Like I have absolutely no idea who those people are, but it's not a government yeah. agency you are prospecting. This is a huge mistake people make. It is a person within a government agency that you are prospecting. And how are they getting their job done today specifically? How are they making the French fries? If you're talking in generalities, you don't know the answer to that question, don't write any emails yet. Start there. Oh, man. Put a fire in my belly. I love it. Uh, This is anonymous. Any advice for a new rep? We actually had a recent college college grad ask a similar question. Uh, It's going to start... First sales calls ever tomorrow. What's your advice? Get to know your prospects jobs that they're doing and how you think you can help them do it better and make sure you can see it as clearly as you can that infomercial. Because if you can't, you're never going to be as good as you can be. Yeah. And and if you're really going to hit the phones tomorrow, uh, don't, don't let it, try not to let it get to you too deep when you get no's or hung up on or just no replies. 
it's a tough job. Uh, okay. So the, 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 debil- the debilitating feeling of rejection comes when you're assuming that what someone has is what you, what you are selling. Right. When you let, when you let go of that, it's not, you don't have the rejection anymore because you're calling to see if they're open to a way that can potentially help them do something better. And if they're not, that's okay too. This idea of detaching from the outcome is rule number one and being indifferent to the outcome. If you're trying to set meetings with every call, you're going to just feel terrible. When I make cold calls, that's not my intent because I'm not going to be so assumptive to think that what I'm having is what's top of mind for everybody that I'm calling. So again, intent is everything because it's going to inform what you say and it's going to intent your act. It's going to inform your actions and ultimately your outcomes. Beautiful thought. It makes me feel very at peace. <laughs> right. <laughs> We've got two more and we're okay. going to do it. We're going to do this. Uh, I'm going to make, excuse me, I'm going to make Max wait a few minutes. Tell him that's Josh okay. made, Sean, him, made, made him wait. He'll, he'll understand. I am absolutely going to blame you. Blame it up. That's fine. <laughs> so Sean Brewers asks, uh, does the, the B2B sales guide uh, show how to structure a multiple email or multiple touch campaign if you're doing omni-channel? Yeah, there are sequences in there. Awesome. Um, and any insight on how to craft a LinkedIn message as opposed to like voicemail or email? Do you approach that differently? Yeah, in the guide. Um, but essentially what I do with a LinkedIn message is I structure it a little bit different. Um, so I'll give you an example of mine. Um, hey, John, noticed that you managed some SDRs over in Austin. I share posts from time to time on how to do things like, you know, book more meetings and diffuse objections. Here's a link to my recent post. Open to connecting. If not, send me your best objection. Beautiful. And you know what we just did? We answered, I counted at least 45 individual questions, which is a record, by the way. I think this is our longest webinar, our, definitely our most productive, uh, best engagement from the attendees who took the time to spend their afternoon or midday with us. Um, I can't thank the community enough for stopping by and being so engaged. And I think they were interested because you, Josh, are interesting. And thank you so much for bringing your A-game. Really appreciate it. One thank last for, call out. Yeah, go ahead. It, go, to the, uh, uh, go to this link and get the uh, badass B2B sales guide. We've already got a couple of people saying they're definitely going to buy it in the chat. Um, do it now. Awesome. Thank you so much, Colin, for the opportunity. And thank you, everybody in the audience for participating. You guys have been delightful. Hit me up on LinkedIn if you have any questions. Thank you so much, Josh. I'll talk to you soon. And see you next week, everybody. Bye-bye. Peace.